Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. So I want to talk today about what I've seen from people who are not super high on the susceptibility scale, like a little lower on the susceptibility scale. In particular, I'm going to talk now about folks who are in like the six and seven range on the scale. I do want to say, though, that I think there are lessons from this discussion that can apply to other places on the susceptibility scale. So wherever you are on the scale, you know, I invite you to listen and see if you can glean lessons that might apply to you. But I'm thinking back to a conversation that I had on a trip to the Pacific Northwest, and there was a, you know, Pacific Northwest's brightest meetup group uh, at Christina's house. And I think we were in Portland and a whole bunch of people were there and uh, a fun time was had by all. Everybody brought their own dinner and uh, we shared. There was a, a moment where I think we, not a moment, longer than a moment, where we decided to eat our dinners in silence for a stretch of time. It was really luscious, so sweet. And during a later phase, a talking phase of the dinner party, I ended up sitting next to a couple people who were both sevens on the susceptibility scale. And we ended up talking about what's different about the experience of a seven. And both of them had been through their sort of exploratory trajectory and had gleaned some real lessons, but they wanted to hear from me, like what's different about being a seven? And, I, and what I said was something like this, you know, the thing about being a seven on the susceptibility scale is what I see often is the consequences for deviating from the bright line eating sort of tried and true strict plan, the consequences are not as severe as they would be, say, for me or someone who's a, a 10 or a 10 plus 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 on the susceptibility scale. Not quite as much pain, not quite as much, you know, falling off the corner, you know, off the rails into the ditch, not as much um, havoc, not as much crashing into the danger and destruction zone. Um, and what can happen is, you know, you sort of look around at other people and you notice, oh, they're worse off than me. Their food addiction is worse than me. Their food addiction is worse than me. And, and it can set up this thinking of like, I don't think I need to really do this thing the way they are. So I'm going to try some planned exceptions here and there. And you notice that some of them or most of them work in the sense that you plan to eat a little food that's off plan and you succeed at it and you go home feeling pretty good. And um, over time though, the accumulated experience of this tends to be um, what feels upon reflection like an unacceptable hit to the whole living happy, thin and free promise, right? Um, maybe not so much the happy part, maybe, um, but maybe the thin part in the sense that those deviations can result in either not enough weight loss or stalled out weight loss, or if you've already gotten down to goal weight, sort of weight creeping back up, and then you're kind of on the merry-go-round of trying to adjust and get it back, and um, or maybe just not ever getting down to goal weight and feeling frustrated about that. And um, sometimes it can even be hard to put two and two together of like, oh, I'm not losing my weight because I keep eating off my plan, right? Um, but the biggest hit is to the freedom. Happy, thin, and free. That freedom from food obsession, which someone who's a seven or an eight or a six definitely experiences the, um, you know, the frustration or um, like this feeling of like, I'm not being the person that I feel called to be when I'm out of alignment with my food. And this niggling feeling of, I'm not doing this the way I feel like I want to be doing it. I'm compromising myself, my values. And there can be a cycle that is put into place of too much thinking about planned exceptions and whether they worked and whether we're going to do them again this weekend and um, then getting back on track after them and then noticing that the weight isn't coming off and the rah, 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 rah. And over a trajectory of bright line eating, if you step back and be like, you know, this isn't what I want. This isn't what I signed on for. This isn't the promise. Like I'm not 
manifesting the full promise of living happy, thin, and free. I'm mucking around with the food, and、um, all of that focus on the planned exceptions and the recovering from them and all that can. Ultimately, keep someone who's a six or a seven or an eight on the susceptibility scale from moving on past the food and the weight to a higher calling, to a deeper life purpose, to feeling really in alignment and in integrity from living happy, thin, and free, and all the promises that come with that, which are ultimately not about food and weight. Mostly, they're mostly about、um, life purpose and. Feeling、um, really free, finally, to explore other avenues in life through deeper, meaningful relationships, through new avenues of exploration, through、um, finally moving past this issue of what we what we eat and what we weigh. Right. So it it's a it's a pothole that is particular to the person who's. A little lower on the susceptibility scale, and is set up from the beginning, thinking I'm not sure that I'm like all these other people, and I think I can get away with doing it a little differently. And whoop, falling into that pothole can can it can last a long time. You can stay in that pothole for a long time because it can take a long time to accumulate the data that shows, in aggregate, this isn't working. Because in a localized sense, it kind of seems to work,、um, in the sense that. You know the wheels don't totally fall off the bus, and you can maybe not notice that the trip isn't progressing actually on schedule. The challenge with all that is that it can be really hard to fix, and the reason is that in any given localized moment, any given restaurant outing or trip or dinner party or whatever, the saboteur can come in. And and marshal a lot of evidence to say it's okay if you eat that thing or drink that drink or whatever. It's worked for you fine before. You always get back on track really easily, and you don't go off the rails. And you do this little exception thing, and it works for you really well. And in the moment, it can be really hard to,、um, with all the social pressure around and the weight of past cues. And fiber tracks in the brain that that's what you do at these types of events is you partake of that stuff at least a little bit.、Um, it can be really hard once you've built in those exceptions to muster the like. No, I don't do that. I don't want to do that. I don't do that because the saboteur kind of in that moment feels really right. You know, I do kind of get away with this. I do get back on track really easily. Whew.、Um, so. It can be a hard one to fix, you know. The fact is that it kind of works on a local level. It kind of works if you just look at the instance, but it doesn't work if you look at the whole picture, right? It actually, in aggregate, keeps you from getting happy, thin, and free. Keeps you from moving on past the food and the weight. So, in the big picture sense, it's not working. But in that evening, it seems like it works, right? We didn't binge. We didn't. Gain five pounds, like it was fine. We were back on track the next day. What's the harm? So、um, when I shared this at this dinner party, they were both like, "Yeah, that's exactly me. That's exactly what's happened." I, you know, I set myself up for planned deviations because I noticed I wasn't as bad as other people, and it seemed like I could handle it. It seemed like I was handling it for a while, and then at some point along the way. Through an accumulation of niggling feelings in my, the back of my mind, I realized I'm not free. I'm not free. Now, both of them that I talked to seemed to have done a good job of breaking free,、um, and、uh, they did it the way the rest of us do it, <laughs> who ultimately break free from unhelpful patterns here at Brightline Eating through working a stronger program, like doubling down on what we do around here.、Um, but as sevens on the scale for them. Um, you know, they had to fight the battle of that voice that said you're different than all those extreme food addicts. You know, if you have food addiction at all, it's super minor, and you really don't need to worry about it much. And you know, these exceptions have always worked for you. They had to really <sighs> come to the point of deciding not to fall for that narrative anymore. 
Then a few months later, I was talking on a Bright Lifers coaching call with a woman who was a six on the susceptibility scale. And a whole different thing emerged. She wasn't fully happy, thin and free because she felt like she was doing it wrong. She was, uh, specifically what she was doing was every once in a while, she was allowing herself to have some NMD, meaning some alcohol, um, at a party or at an event or at a whatever, right? With her spouse or whatever it was. Um, we're talking maybe an aggregate, you know, four drinks a month, something like that. And they were always planned and written down in advance. And, uh, they never impacted her food, not once. Uh, it was almost always one drink, but, um, a couple, two, three times it had been two drinks. But the impact of this, uh, little, you know, um, step outside the bright lines with alcohol for her meant that she was, um, perseverating on this feeling of like, uh, I'm not a good example of a bright line eating member. She's a bright lifer and very involved in the community. And she kept feeling like she wasn't doing it right. I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it right. And she wrote into the coaching call and what she asked for was a slap on the wrist. She wanted me to talk some sense into her, uh, which I do for people quite often on those calls. I, I will absolutely, you know, deliver tough love in doses, hopefully with the love. Not tough love without the love, but you know, I will sometimes absolutely get tough with someone. I read her form. I asked her a few questions and what I came to was something entirely different. I was like, look, are you happy? She was like, yeah, I'm so happy. I was like, are you thin? Are you in a right size body? She's like, oh yeah, I got down into a right size body. I've been maintaining my weight. I, I couldn't be at a more ideal weight. I just feel so good in my body. I was like, are you free? She said, no. And I said, okay. Are you not free? Because after you drink those drinks, your head tells you, I want more. Maybe I should eat some food now. Did I eat the right amount? Maybe I want to plan some heavier choices for tomorrow. Maybe I want to have another drink tomorrow. Maybe am I going to drink next weekend? Am I? Get-? She's like, no, I never have thoughts like that. I was like, after you drink that one or two drinks, it leaves your mind entirely for days upon days upon days. She said, yeah. I said, and it never impacts your food or your weight and it never escalates. And she said, right. I said, so why aren't you free? And she said, cause I feel like I'm doing it wrong. I'm not a good bright line eating member. And I said, you're a six on the scale, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, oh, sweetheart, I am not about to read you the riot act. This is a case of you needing to take a stand for working the program in a way that works for you. Those drinks aren't tipping over the apple cart. They're not sinking the ship. For you, they're fine. Now, everyone listening, I'm not talking to you if you're higher on the scale. I am not. I might not even be talking to you if you're a six on the scale because every a six is not a six is not a six. I was talking to her. In her experience, it wasn't messing with her weight. It wasn't escalating. It wasn't disrupting her serenity at all. There was just some sort of moralistic pressure of like, she wanted to be, what she wanted to be was in the fold, in the bright line eating fold. And I said, you are, you are, we all need to be self-responsible around here. I find myself saying that a lot these days, this theme of self-responsibility. And that means so many things. But in this instance, it means claiming our right to work the program in the way that works for us. If we're being honest with ourselves about that, digging deep and being really honest about it. And if we're not the typical, which around here happens to be pretty high on the susceptibility scale, If we're lower, it means claiming what works for us, even if that is a deviation from the standard. But the key is, do you feel free? Like, is it niggling in your mind? Is it going around and around and around in a way that's keeping you stuck with your food and your weight and what you've eaten or not eaten? Or is it really just 
some sort of perceived pressure about how we do things around here in Bright Line Eating. Honestly, toss that out. Really, really. The straight and narrow is there as a starting place and as a set of guidelines for people who are really sick and tired of being sick and tired. You want a straight, clean, clear roadmap out of the hell, that's where it lies, on that straight and narrow path. But after you've been walking on it for a while, after your brain is, you know, really largely healed up, you are self-responsible. And if you're lower on the scale, what I've seen is that means that your burden isn't the one of like constant binging your brains out in the ditch. Your burden is one of needing to figure out where the exceptions work for you and where they don't. Where they really serve you and where they don't. And letting go of any perception of externalized judgment about your program. Stand in it, stand firm. And always ask yourself, how free do you wanna be? And what's really working for you? So that's what I've seen on the path of people who are not tens, but more like sixes and sevens on the susceptibility scale. And I'll see you next week.